Hello, greetings. Welcome to the fourth summer seminarian talk of the summer <laughs> at St. John Newman Parish. And today's talk is on friendship with God. And some questions you might want to examine for this talk uh, may be some of the following. What do I know about my particular friendship with God? Where are we at together? That is, what is his disposition towards me? And what is my disposition towards him? So we will be examining uh, some of these questions and through insights on happiness, uh, what makes us happy, the Trinity, characteristics, uh, characteristics of friendship, and also how God reveals his desire for friendship with, with, with man. So why don't, we be, why don't we begin with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you call each of us by name. You know us intimately and well, as you said to the prophet Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Remain with us, Lord, and bless your people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, to begin, let's start with what everyone is first and foremost most concerned about. What is going to make me happy? Uh, to be happy is really the motivating desire for every action and every decision we make. Uh, my old police officer colleague, I used to be a police officer in, in D.C., and uh, he'd, I'd always ask, hey, hey, Jimmy, are we supposed to do A, B, and C, blah, blah, blah? And he'd say, Connor, Connor, do what makes you happy. <laughs> no. I'd say, okay, well, what does make me happy? <laughs> no. Well... Fortunately for us, the Catechism teaches us we are happy, we are free when we do what we were created for. And what were we created for? We were created for love, to know, love, and serve God, God who is love, and to be happy with Him in this life and forever in the next. Now, so what is an insight about um, from Scripture that we can take that tells us a little bit more about ourselves and 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 furthers us in trying to attain uh, happiness. Well, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, It is not good that man should be alone. It is not good that man should be alone. Well, this reveals for us that, that man cannot actually exist by himself. Man within himself is not sufficient for his own happiness. He needs another. Man is unlike God in this regard. It's a beautiful reality check. <laughs> See, God is totally self-sufficient, and we are here out of sheer generosity <laughs> of, of him, of his generosity, that he wanted us to participate in him. And that's, what's gonna, that's what makes us happy, is our participation in, in him. See, God is sufficiently happy within himself. And we know that God is a community of persons. And we come to see that you and I are call called to participate in the love of those three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And without love, without God, really, we, we don't make sense. We can't make sense of ourselves. Uh, JP2 said this very beautifully. He says, Man cannot live without love. He remains a being that is incomprehensible for himself. His life is senseless if love is not revealed to him, if he does not encounter love, if he does not experience it and make it his own, if he does not participate intimately in it. Love is the reason for our existence. So what is a way in which we participate in love in God? Well, here's where we come to friendship. Friendship is a way in which we can act towards God and God can act or God acts towards us. Friendship is the word that describes the original relationship between God and man before the fall. Paradise, man's relationship with God before the fall consisted of friendship. But in what way is friendship uh, that God has towards us revealed to us, to man? As JP2 
said it needs be done. <laughs> it needs to be revealed to us. Well, if you read through scriptures, you come to observe that all of salvation history, from Adam to Abraham to Moses and the Israelites and so on, is really a demonstration of God's attempt to reestablish this friendship uh, between himself and man uh, that was lost at the fall in the garden. And of course, and, and then it was refused uh, continuously and feared uh, for generations and generations and still is. Uh, but it is, has been restored in Christ with his sacrifice. And, and we'll, come, we'll come to address this more as we continue. Uh, but going back to Genesis before the fall, when things were perfect, what was man and God like? Well, what were they doing? Well, let's observe. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In the cool of the day. They used to walk together amongst the garden. These, these phrases are, are beautiful insights. And the, the phrase is, In the cool of the day, and the Lord God walking in the garden. They symbolize a mysterious truth that point to God's desire for friendship with man. So at the cool of the day, when, when is that? Well, it's the evening time. And we know from experience, the evening time is, is the time of intimacy between peoples. You see it in all cultures, in our culture. After working hard throughout the day, we finish, and what do we do? <laughs> we gather in community. We stop work and simply be together. We might share an activity, a board game, a, a meal, or, or a walk. It's, a, it's very wonderful. I'm, I'm so grateful. It's been a blessing to be here at St. John Newman Parish, but, uh, and there's been many graces and fruits of, of which I'm grateful for, for being here. But one of the um, um, a, a, a very um, a sweet witness that I've gotten to uh, see is the friendship between Father Sweeney and Monsignor Pankey, and Father Bill, of course, but uh, in particular with Father Sweeney and Monsignor, they love to go on walks together. What consists of their friendship is walking. <laughs> and uh, they're actually doing a great uh, long hike, uh, inching miles upon miles, up, eventually up to the Potomac. So um, I'm sure they'll keep you up to date on that. Um, but it's a beautiful, it's beautiful thing to witness of their friendship. So what consists of the friendship between God and man in the beginning, in the, in the garden? Well, just this, walking. They walk together, go on walks. Walking is the other word in sacred scripture that reveals this insight of the friendship between Adam and God. Walking with a friend is a way in which we rest. What do we do? We talk share each other's thoughts and desires. There's a beautiful harmony between two persons walking. One of the most mysterious but beautiful lines in Scripture, one of my favorites, uh, mentions this guy named Enoch. <laughs> and, um, and then he's, he's uh, well, he, he's gone after that. It, it, Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. <laughs> It's something actually to ponder. It's a very short, brief mentioning of this guy, but I mean, what what did he do? <laughs> Why was he so important to be enough important enough to be mentioned in the scriptures? What did he have? Well, what did he do? He walked. And what did he have? He had friendship with God. Sweethearts walk together. Walking together, you see, has a has a certain rhythm and a harmony to it. It mirrors music in a way. It's kind of like dancing. It's even seen in the Orthodox rite in their liturgy for weddings. Uh, the bride and the groom will walk three times in a circle around an anti-altar. And uh, to confirm my, my Google search, I uh, reached out to a dear beloved buddy of mine uh, who's Orthodox, and I said, am, am I correct in all this? <laughs> and he responded to me, and he said, yes, sir. This is called the dance of Isaiah, when the, when the bride and the groom are led by the priest around the anti-altar and they walk together three times around that altar. And he says, this is called the dance of Isaiah. 
and it includes the same prayers that are sung at the ordination of a priest. The last hymn says, Behold, a virgin is with child and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is why it's called the Dance of Isaiah, because that line is from <laughs> Isaiah. Basically, it's a celebrate. He, he continues, Basically, it's a celebration of the idea of covenant. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Walking, dancing, is the response we have towards covenant. To make covenant. To make covenant is a, to make a lasting bond between people. And that's something so beautiful. And as we'll see in continuing the talks, I'll be speaking of forever, but we're meant for forever. We're meant for a lasting bond. A, uh, a, a union, a, a unity between two, per, between us and God, uh, that that is for eternity. But another insight for us is where would they walk? Well, wherever you see God and man walking amongst trees in the cool of the day, take note. This signifies God's desire for intimacy with His creation. In another way, once again, trees you'll see, are the place of encounter with God. And hence, my I've chosen to sit outside for this, and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> but trees are the place of encounter with God. Adam in the Garden of Eden. Abraham at the Oak of Mambra. Moses at the Burning Bush. Uh, king David, after he's anointed king, and when he's off to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, the Lord says to him, And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then bestir yourself, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. Very beautiful. The sound marching, <laughs> uh, the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees. It's actually a beautiful uh, insider friend told me some time ago that uh, each species of trees um, will have a different sound when the wind blows blows through them because the leaves are all shaped differently. If you ever take a uh, um, some respite underneath a tree, you can consider this um, and think of God <laughs> and His mysterious and beautiful creation. Uh, but later in, in Scripture, we see this, again, this harmony uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In John, uh, in the New Testament, where in John chapter 1, verse 48, when Jesus uh, encounters, or Nathaniel encounters our Lord. And he says to Nathaniel, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So, now that we've seen God's desire for friendship and how it is manifested through Scripture, or some of the ways in which it is, uh, let us speak of a few characteristics of friendship, of which I'm going to mention three. They are sacredness, is an aspect of, of friendship, uh, benevolence, and being known. So, um, sacredness. There's a sacredness to friendship. Sacred means set apart. With friends, there are some things shared between friends that uh, other people are not privy to. A degree of intimacy, a seclusion, uh, you know, but not everyone knows. Uh, it is very particular. It is uniquely you and uniquely the other. There is only, there's only, because <laughs> there's only one you and only one them, irreplaceable. See, you can love with your unique and unrepeatable mind and heart in only the way that you can, as you are unique and unrepeatable. Benevolence. Benevolence is another aspect here. A wishing well towards one another. Your good is my good. Um, I, I'm very fond of, of imaginative prayer, and uh, I encourage um, to kind of maybe close your eyes or uh, take this later for um, contemplation. But I like to picture God as, as a king sometimes. Oh, we're in the middle of an airfield here. <laughs> and uh, so you have to put up with that. But um, so I'm going to read through this a little story 
um, something to pray about and uh, and use it for your own prayer but imagine there is a king wealthy and of no needs self-sufficient but he's a good king everyone enjoys his company he's the delight at gatherings he's kind and benevolent he's a well-loved king and then there's you you're selfish at times though you don't have much your clothes well you only have shabby ones well imagine this king taking an interest in you being concerned about you but not in a demeaning or dismissive way uh, far from it he, he wants to incorporate everything about you to himself a special invitation is sent to you to celebrate a feast and when you arrive in your shabby clothes you hear there is a beautiful music and people are walking or dancing together you see you don't quite fit in as you look around and there are other people there uh, the other people there are, are of higher renown and seeming higher renown and seeming worth than you yourself these people have demonstrated more acts of heroism shown towards this benevolent king than you could ever fathom to do yourself and you're feeling a little bit out of place more so when all of a sudden the music stops and you notice some commotion and see that the king has hopped from his throne and is running and he's running towards you he rushes towards you with a great smile and embraces you with a wide hug and lifts your hands and exclaims to all this this is my beloved friend the people in fine clothing cheer and celebrate you and then the king pulls you aside and the music continues and he pleads he pleads to you to do what that you might walk with him around the halls to do what to talk and catch up about what about you <laughs> he just wants to hear about you and as you walk and spend days in his presence he gives you his ring and his robe and you over time in his company you become of you become to resemble your very good friend and over time you yourself are arrayed in splendor well of course this benevolent king is god and the man arrayed in splendor over time eventually is you and i and who are those friends who are cheering those were the saints the king lowered himself and raises us up so how did he make us his friends by by doing that <laughs> he becomes man so that he might become so that we might become like him second philippians saint paul speaking of jesus says he emptied himself taking the form of a slave coming in human likeness why well because in order to be friends there must be a degree of equality see like is unto like and we pick up traits from people we accompany like father like son or you see this in, in sports uh, if you if you want to be a better ice hockey player or a better track player cross country tennis what have you uh, you play with the players that are better than you uh, but there still needs to be this this degree of, of meeting you where you at playing the same game almost well the Saints knew this and demonstrated this beautifully with being friends with God and over time they picked up supernatural qualities God-like qualities you see in the life of Moses for example when he's coming down from Mount Sinai Exodus 34 29 says as he came down from the mountain Moses did not know that the skin of his face shown because he had been talking with God you still see this in the Saints there's a there's one of my favorite stories of, of uh, the beloved st. John Marie Vianney the cure to ours uh, of course um, have a lovely or I uh, uh, love him very much he's a wonderful wonderful saint and somewhat obligated to as he is the patron of, of parish priests and seminarians and, um, uh, but there's a, one of my favorite stories of him um, was about a man who was en route to see the cure de Ars back in the 1800s when he was the John Vianney was alive, <laughs> and because uh, he 
heard such renown of, of the priest, of, of John Marie. And he wanted to see if the big talk was what the big talk about him being a saintly figure uh, was all about. Well, en route to ours, France, to see uh, this holy priest, Jean Marie, uh, he was he a travel. This traveler passed a man pa walking away from ours, and uh, tears. He was wiping tears from his eyes as he was as he was leaving ours. And the traveler asked them, the teary-eyed man, "What? Why are you crying?" And having just come from seeing the renowned curé de Ars himself, he responded sweetly and tearfully, I have seen God in a man. I have seen God in a man. To see God in a man and to see that God is so good that this man was crying not tears of fear or anxiety or tearful trepidation about God, but tears of love, sweet tears, Tears a sojourner longs for on a wearisome journey, searching for an end in sight and has finally arrived. These are dear tears, tears that say, I have found where I can rest my heart. See, our hearts ache for the divine. We long for friendship with Christ. It's what we were made for, the original plan. So come to know the saints and you will see aspects of the goodness of our beloved Creator. And so too with the Christian. In time, in the company of, of God who is with us in our hearts and in the tabernacle, in time we come to resemble traits of our divine friend. And what are those traits? Well, virtues, meekness, purity, gentleness, joy, charity. So another aspect of friendship, or fruit of friendship rather here, is, is being known. It is beautiful and good and desirable to be known. Uh, we see the craving for it with social media, uh, but it's a good, it's a natural desire. We're created to be known, and we're, we are eternal beings. And this is to say your soul is eternal, infinite, unending. My soul is infinite, unending. And it hit me in contemplating this uh, being known and 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 having an infinite soul, the, the, the beautiful mystery and beautiful reality that there's always something new to be known and learned and experienced with another person um, in this life because you, you can never fully come to know in this life an infinite person. But there is one that can and does know you infinitely, inside and out, who knows you perfectly. Well, this is God, your best friend. With all your faults and failings, He still knows you and He loves you. He says to you and I what He said to the prophet Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Well, how does God demonstrate this? Well, it is found amongst the trees of Calvary. It is there amongst those trees that he now reconciles the fault had with the trees amongst the trees in Eden. Through the tree on Calvary, our Savior restores the friendship between God and man. It's through exposing himself fully, making himself fully known on the cross that Jesus says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus makes himself known. Jesus exposes himself on the cross. And what does he make known? Well, that you and I are loved, and that God desires your love in response to his. The unique and unrepeatable way in which only you can love, with only your heart and with only your mind and with only your soul, and then finally, Scripture brings us amongst the trees of Emmaus, where we see God, having restored fallen creation, making all things new, having risen from the dead, God joins in walking with his beloved friends amongst the trees once more. As it says, Luke 24, verse 15. While they were 
While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. One of the fortunate things about being here at St. John Newman Parish is that our perpetual adoration chapel uh, has been moved so we can have uh, adoration outside, or our Lord inside the church, but everybody else can still adore him from the outside. And there's people sitting outside there and adoring our Lord. And as I pass by, it, it is really something very beautiful to see that, to see our beloved Lord there in the Eucharist and the person adoring him. Uh, and then swaying above them both are the trees and the wind passing through the branches. And I see and I know that God is with them and that God is with me and that God is with you. So in closing, let us turn to Mary, who is mother and who can teach us how to be better friends to her son. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Right, God bless you.